So, hello folks far and wide. Here's Paul Scorpin speaking to you from uh, my seminar room here in Bavaria, in Germany, southern Germany, just uh, in the shadow, not the shadow, but uh, from a very famous monastery on Dex. It's just, uh, you can see it there. Um, I came here today uh, to give a treatment and also I'm waiting for uh, the technician to come to install my telephone, but I uh, wanted to share something with you because something was going through my my mind. Uh, a couple days ago I awoke and uh, went to Facebook and I, I belong to a couple of Facebook groups uh, apart from my own, which is uh, built up around my work theosis, uh, another one called Esoteric Christianity, and I saw that somebody posted an old friend of mine, he's known as Peter Simon on the on that page, um, and he posted a post about Daskalos because he'd, he'd, been in, uh, he'd been in Cyprus at the time and attended some of Daskalos' lessons. We've been in communication for the last year off and on about Daskalos, and he said uh, in the uh, post, that Dusclus, uh, on the day that Dusclus gave a talk uh, in the Stoa, uh, he never had to prepare, which was true. And he said uh, the reason he didn't have to prepare was because he could tune into the audience uh, in a matter of seconds and see what they needed, and that was also true. And I wrote back, I said that another reason why Dusclus didn't need to prepare was because Dusclus himself was in tune with the beloved John. Uh, from from the time of Jesus uh, Christ, uh, John, who Dusclus said wrote the Gospel and also wrote the Apocalypse, uh, and Dusclus uh, since the time of Christ, they have been uh, they've been very very close, and I remember after I arrived. Uh, in Cyprus to start my work with Dusclus. Dusclus would sit here and I would sit there. Uh, I called myself his bodyguard in some sense because uh, I made sure he had water, especially in the in the dog days of summer. And also uh, I would help him to turn, all, turn over the cassette tape and, and see if he was okay. In any case, I would, you know, when he gave a talk, uh, I would often close my eyes and go into a state of reception or meditation, and uh, I noticed that about 10-15 minutes into the talk, a golden, sh a golden light mist would come into the room, uh, golden yellow light would come into the room, and it would settle over Daskalos, and then very subtly Daskalos's talk would change, both in, both in force and also partly in context. You wouldn't know it unless you unless you attended a lot of Dusclos' lessons, but it took place, as I said, normally around ten minutes into the talk, and I uh, started to become aware of that because I sat there and I even opened my eyes and could see it, and uh, I went to Dusclos and I said, Dusclos, um, you know, I, I noticed that. So ten minutes into your talk, uh, you're visited by an energy, and. Um, what is that? And he said, oh, that's good that you see that. That's the, uh, that's the evangelist uh, John, the Apostle John. Uh, he comes uh, to me and he enters me and I'm totally awake, so it's, 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 not, uh, it's not channeling per se. Uh, and he gives the talks. And when John comes into my body, said Daskalos, then I stand up, not with this body, but with the uh, astral body, or if you will, and I go to the back of the stoa and find a place, and I watch John teach. Okay, and uh, so that's another reason why I told Peter Simon on that on that exchange the other day. I said, you know, that's another reason why why uh, Dusclos didn't need to prepare for an audience of 60, 70, 80 people because John would know exactly what they needed. Um, and then uh, Peter posed another question about the talks in New York, uh, New York City at the New York Town Hall. Uh, we arranged an invitation that Dusclos, I think this was in '93, Dusclos would, uh, would we would travel to uh, the city, New York, and Dusclos would give uh, two talks there, which he did, and. Peter thought that uh, some people left the talks he heard. He wasn't himself 
he wasn't a self, himself in attendance, but he heard from other people that people left the talks uh, because they found it strange or whatever, it doesn't matter. And that's not my recollection, but, I, but it did get me thinking about a couple of things um, about Dusclos, which, which are actually quite extraordinary. And Dusclos used two terms uh, to describe uh, spiritual developments. He said there's a, there's a period in our spiritual developments which we're still occupied with egoism. Egoism is basically self, self-orientation. You're, you're, you're worried about yourself, you're suffering for yourself, you, you're trying to justify yourself, you're trying to uh, defend yourself. Uh, and you need you're, you you fluctuate between insecurity and, and pride, and that's what everybody we we go through that phase, and then we reach a phase where Dasla said we reach a state where we're basically egoless, and we are then in the ego. And for Dasla, the ego had a strong connection with the I am consciousness that John presents in his. Um, his gospel, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am, I am the door. And the, uh, the ego consciousness or the I am consciousness is, uh, it, it, is, it, is, it is free of any personal egoism. In other words, it might, it might, it might suffer only because the world is suffering, okay? It suffers with the world, not, 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 because, not because the ego self is suffering anymore, you know? And so that's a state of development where you actually you rise upon you arise, you arise above your personal needs, and you start to serve the divine. Okay, serving the divine, you can it, it can take many different uh, many many different manifestations. One can be spiritual teaching, spiritual healing. Others can be in the arts. Other can be in others can be in politics. Others can be in in, in this, this. You can serve the divine without egoism in a million ways, okay? It's, and they're all very, very important. Uh, and when you uh, awaken the ego consciousness, the I am consciousness, like Daskalos was, uh, you you do that. That's your impulse. Your impulse is because because the divine is has served you, you want to serve the divine, okay? and. Uh, because when uh, Peter Simon asked me this question about what happened in New York, New York City, I got to thinking about Dasculos as a teacher and Dasculos as a human being. And there is a distinction there. Uh, the great American Buddhist uh, Jack Cornfield wrote a book about 20 years ago uh, titled uh, Before Enlightenment Doing, uh, Doing uh, Laundry. And after enlightenment, doing laundry. It's called. It was a book entitled Ecstasy. And uh, Mr. Cornfield went around and he interviewed uh, people of different paths and different faiths, belief systems, and he asked them what it was like to be in ecstasy. And as he writes it, he said he said many many of these people experienced ecstasies, ecstasy, ecstatic states. When they were were removed from life, in other words, when they were when they were in deep meditation in the Himalayas, or someplace else, where they were were alone and were not subject to uh, temptation, uh, then they could enter states of ecstasy. But they couldn't. Uh, write, writes Mr. Cornfield, they couldn't stay there. Okay, they couldn't stay in an ecstatic state because the moment they came down from there mountain uh, they were then involved with students or they were involved with families and they and they and suddenly emotions came up and and they would fall out of ecstasy and I remember reading that book about 20 years ago you know just after Dasculus had passed over and I thought uh, what would happen if Mr. Cornfield had met Dasculus because Dasculus was always uh, and here's the caveat Dasculus was almost almost always in the Christ consciousness. Dusclos was so attractive as a, as a teacher and a healer because he was Christ-like. And uh, there were only a couple of times in, my, in the six uh, years that I spent with Dusclos where he 
became angry. Uh, a couple of times had to do with his own personal family, his children. Uh, a couple of times had to do with the Turkish invasion in 1974. And so he would come out of that and he would then become uh, Stelianus Ateshlis, his, his given name, for about five minutes. Uh, but I said that was a very, very rare occasion. Because most of the time Duskalus was totally in tune with love and with, with, uh, with mercy and with serving the divine through healing and teaching. And um, Duskalus was a individual who needed very little uh, sleep. He slept, as far as I know, he slept about two or three hours a night. And the other hours of the night, uh, Duskless would paint pictures. Here's one I have many, because Duskless used to give them to me for my birthday. Uh, and this is one that he gave me, which I, which I really like. It's on my website because it symbolizes the mental plane, symbolizes the emotional plane, and the earthly plane. And here is the heart chakra feeding. And he would make these pictures, these landscapes at night, uh, sometimes two or three or four or five, and he would hang them in his uh, living room to dry. And sometimes in the early morning I would go there and to, to see how he's doing and to make him a, co a cup of coffee. And Daskos would say, Paul, please come, I want to show you, I want to show you uh, some of the pictures that I painted uh, this night. And I would then go with him around the room and he would say, well, how do you like this one? And the thing with Duskless is you, 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 couldn't, you couldn't be dishonest. You learned that very quickly. He knew when you were, when you were being coy or when you were, being, when you were lying. And so I learned right away that I had to tell Duskless how I felt about something. Otherwise, otherwise he wouldn't trust me or he wouldn't, we wouldn't have a connection that we had. And so there's a fly. And so when we went around the room, I would say, Duskly, you know, I really like that one. I, you know, I, for my next birthday, if you could paint me one like that, I would really be happy. And then we'd go to the next one. And if I was, if, if it didn't really uh, please me or if it didn't, if it didn't, if I didn't like it, it didn't suit my, suit my, suit my taste. And I would say, Duskly, it's nice, uh, but it's, it's not one for me. It's from somebody else. And at that moment, you could see that Duskless was a little bit hurt. And here's the distinction. Duskless made these paintings to support the family. He would sell them to the people who came, you know. And that would be his income. And the income, not was, the income was not personal. Rather, it was for his, his grandchildren and his, his own children. But if you told Duskless that you didn't, you didn't really like a painting, you could see that something in him was hurt. Uh, and that was Stelianus Ateshelis, because it was Stelianus Ateshelis as an artist who was creating these paintings, not as a teacher and not as a healer. Uh, and there he was vulnerable, uh, not really vulnerable, but vulnerable enough that you could say that that, that, was, that was his egoism, and not in a bad way at all. But his ego, when it served the divine, uh, was not at all vulnerable because uh, ego as the I am consciousness cannot, is not aggressive, so it cannot be aggressed against. So this brings me to New York. When we got the invitation to come and uh, the Duskless would give talks, Duskless was reluctant. Uh, had to do with America, and he found uh, because of Cyprus and the Middle East policies that uh, my, my country had at that time, he found Americans to be rather uh, loud <laughs> and, uh, and uh, would put their, as he would say, put their feet on the table, you know, uncouth. Uh, and, but I was uh, pleading Dusklos to go to my, to my homeland. Uh, I was very proud of Dusklos and I, and I thought that he could do America some good. Uh, so, uh, Maybe that was part of the reason why he agreed to travel there. And we flew there um, and landed in, uh, I don't know which airport we landed in, LaGuardia. And we took a taxi to Manhattan, where our hotel was. And I'll never forget this, but uh, Duskless was dressed in his, uh, 
uh, suit and uh, that he had made for the trip and you know I was just ecstatic because here I was with Daskalos in, uh, in New York City and the next day he would give a talk and the day after that he would give a talk. Talks were sold out, 3,000 people. But when Daskalos got out of the taxi it was, it was literally like he stepped out of the Old Testament or the New Testament. It was like he stepped out of the taxi and he did not fit in at all in New York City. And what I know about New York City from my short visits there is everybody fits into New York City. But it was like he was stepping out of a time frame which was 2,000, 3,000 years ago into a modern time. And he just turned to me and he said, Paul, when are we going home? <laughs> and I said, Dusty, we have a little bit of work to do and then we're going to go home, okay? And um, we settled in the hotel and it was arranged that uh, uh, a magazine would uh, was wanted to interview Daskalos Common Boundaries, and they sent a uh, they sent a reporter to us, uh, Mark Matushik, uh, who came and uh, started to interview Daskalos. And the conditions of the interview was that he wouldn't ask anything very personal. And uh, Mark was a, Mark is a very sweet man uh, and a mystic himself. And he, at the end, he started asking questions about the time of Christ, and it was agreed that he wouldn't do that for whatever reasons, not to be, just not to be provocative. And I, I broke it up. I said, you know, Mark, uh, we had an agreement that you wouldn't get personal. But Mark writes in the when in this in this interview, which is on my website and other websites, Mark uh, writes that when he came in, he met this man who was at least six two, a uh, massive man. And Dusclos, I'm six two and a half, and Dusclos was probably five nine or five ten, but because of his aura or his projection, uh, Mark experienced him as a as a massive man, uh, and also uh, just a, another aside. Uh, Mark said that he was playing with his uh, with his prayer with his. Uh, his worry beads, and actually those were prayer beads in the in the Orthodox belief system. Now here it was. So the talks were sold out in New York, in the New York uh, Town Hall, and we went there for the first talk. Uh, and they had prepared a beautiful stage filled with flowers, uh, and Dusclos loved flowers. And uh, the talk, I think, started at seven o'clock in the evening. And Dusclos walked from behind the stage. He didn't have a translator. He didn't need one. His English was excellent. A little bit archaic, but it was excellent. He walked onto the stage with his cane, went around the flowers, and settled in a chair. And I thought, super, now these people are going to hear a great talk about our moral development, how elementals, how we take elementals in from family, from, from personal karma, and people are going to be really inspired and go away with some tools to develop themselves. That evening, Daskalos gave a talk which was very abstract, had to do with cosmology, had to do with planets, and the people uh, liked it a lot. They, they applauded him uh, sitting. Nobody laughed, okay? And after the talk was over, Duskla stood up, uh, went around the flowers, came to me, and he said, how did we do? And Duskla hardly ever, ever used the I form. He always said we, because he did it with John. So he said, how did we do? And I said, Duskla, you know, that was really, really good. Uh, but maybe tomorrow night, when, when you give the second talk, uh, you could talk a little bit more about elementals and about the development of the bodies and so forth. And Duskalos just looked at me and he smiled and he slapped me on the back and he said, Paul, that's just what your people needed. That's just what your people needed. And he walked away. And he was not, he was totally un, unmoved by that. The next night we go out. The flowers are still there. Same people are in the audience because they came from all over, you know, to, to, to see this great teacher. And Daskalos walked out on the stage again with his cane and his, his jacket and sat down and he gave an extraordinary talk. If you ever have a chance to 
watch the talks, two of both of them didn't do it or hear them, he gave an extraordinary talk about the bodies, about uh, cleaning ourselves, about waking up, about having compassion for each other, about coming into the Christ consciousness and uh, transcending pain. It's gorgeous talk, gorgeous talk. And at the end, everybody stood up and gave him a standing ovation for, for at least 10, 15 minutes. You know what Duskless did? He stood up, did not acknowledge the applause, not because he was cold, but because it didn't mean anything to him, because he didn't give the talk, so he didn't need the praise. It wasn't even a game, it was just he didn't need the praise. Instead, he stood up, came around, <laughs> and he said, okay, inside he must have said, I'm done with my work now. I've given two talks as planned. Now I get to look at the flowers. And instead of acknowledging that 3,000 people were standing on their feet, blown away by a talk he just gave, he went and he started to study the flowers that were on the stage. Studied them all for about 5-10 minutes just to see what they were, because he loved flowers. And then he came around the stage, he came to me and he said, So Paul, how did we, how did we do? And I said, Duskless, that was gorgeous. Thank you so much. That's exactly what my people needed. And you know what Duskless did? He took his hand and he patted me on the back and he said, Paul, that was just what they needed. That was exactly the same response from the night before. Because Duskless was serving the divine. And he didn't decide what he would teach. He was a riverbed for the divine. And when the divine teaches, it teaches perfectly. And Duskless taught perfectly. Before I close this talk, I'll just share with you another example. This is the difference between ego and egoism. In his living room, early in the morning, when he shows me his pictures that he painted, there he's Stylianus Ateshles. In New York City, in the town hall, where Dusclos gives two talks, he's no longer Stylianus Ateshles. He's, he's in the ego. He's completely in tune with John and with Christ. Somewhere about two years into my stay, a company in the States called Sounds True, they still exist, wrote us and they said, you know, we've heard about uh, uh, Dasculos and we'd love to prepare a um, maybe a four or six cassette uh, cassette tape set to to, to produce and to sell. That's what they were doing. They were interviewing or giving recording talks of, of great teachers and preparing them and, and distributing them uh, on their website or before that was before the websites. Good company. And they wrote me and, and they said, you know, Paul, we, we understand you work with Dusclos and that you're his secretary and sometimes. Uh, could you send us some tapes? And I consulted with his daughter, Paniota, and with Dusclos, and he said, sure. And so I sent him about 10 tapes. And then came uh, a letter about three or four weeks later from Sounds True saying, you know, Paul, thank you so much. The, the, the tapes were extraordinary. Uh, we enjoyed them very much, and we'd love to produce them. It's not a question. However, Dusclos repeats himself a lot. And even in a single talk, he, he might say the same thing a little differently uh, two or three times in the 90-minute in the talk. Uh, we would like to edit the tapes that, uh, that they flow much more and that Dusclos doesn't repeat himself. And I thought, yeah, this, that would be good. Why not? And then I went to Duskly and I said, Duskly, you know, uh, this company, they really like your material, uh, you and the plural you and John, they like your material. Uh, and they would just like to simply edit them, that, uh, that they would fit on uh, in a four or six, six uh, cassette set. Um, so can, can I tell them that they can, they can do some uh, cut, uh, splicing and cutting, cutting and splicing? And he said, no. <laughs> he said, no, they're not allowed to touch a talk. And I said, why not, Dusley? They say that you repeat yourself. He said, that's John. 
John repeats himself. It's an old Greek way of teaching. Old Greek way of teaching where you try to you try to disarm the intellect by confusing it. You know, so you're sitting there and Dusklas said, okay, Dusklas said this, and now it's 20 minutes later and he's saying it again, I don't have to listen to it because I just heard it. I process it. I have it. And then 20 minutes would pass and he would say the same thing again. And then you would think somehow you can just take what Dusklas said and you can put it into boxes and you can say, this is what he said, this is what he said. I got the message. But you're not transformed by it. And Dusklas said that the way John teaches through Dusklas is he repeats himself because he wants to disarm the intellect, that the intellect gives up, and that the message goes in deeply into the heart and into the solar plexus and into the subconsciousness where it'll be received and not mastered. The intellect, the intellect wants to master information, wisdom. The heart doesn't. The solar plexus doesn't. Can't. And it receives it. You know. So, I made this short talk uh, because of a comment that Peter Simon made, and I'm going to just take this now and I'll put it on my Facebook page uh, as a way of explaining what happened in New York City. Nobody walked out. It was, it was an extraordinary uh, two days. It was an extraordinary visit in the States. Afterwards, we, we flew up to Maine to spend some time with my parents on the Maine coast. The Dusklas would get some rest, uh, which was nice. He also gave a talk there. Meant a lot to my parents, uh, my late parents. But uh, if you have any questions more about Dusklos and how he was, and uh, how I saw him, because uh, I was very, very close to him, spent a lot of time with him. I was the only one, along with Paniotto, who traveled with him to 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 Germany here and Switzerland and Austria and then also to the States and to Brazil. So I'd be uh, very welcome to, to receive more questions and make these short talks. I'm getting rather sentimental or nostalgic in my, my old age. And um, even though Dusklis is now 22 years, no longer Stylianus Ateshelis, uh, these these six seven years that I spent on Cyprus were 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 an eternity, uh, and they were they were they were endless. And that Dusklis nurtured me and and taught me. Not only was I his bodyguard, I became his primary recipient along with his daughter of his inner teachings uh, over the course of the over the course of the six years. And that's what I. Actually, that's what I teach here. I, I, that's what I teach here in, in my seminar room here in Healing and on, on the online talks and everywhere else. I fly tomorrow to Denmark to teach. Uh, so, I, yeah, that's, uh, that's just a short message and I, I hope you're all doing very well. Uh, we're having a very, very slow developing springtime here in Bavaria. The trees are basically, since about six weeks, they, they just say we're not going to let go of our, we're not going to let our leaves uh, grow until it becomes a bit warmer. So, all right. So, I wish you all well. Take care. And I, you're, we're coming uh, slowly into the Pentecost site. I'll be with a group in the Holy Land uh, for part of the Pentecost uh, for the Crystal Himophot, uh, the Christ Ascension. So take care everybody and uh, I hope you all are well and stay well and stay in peace and love and hope. Okay, thank you. <laughs>